Let's do this quickly because I have the president of Imani um, Africa, the president and founder of Imani Africa, that's Franklin Kujo. Um, this is actually his first time, you know, visiting Metro Television. Can you imagine? He should have been here a long time ago because his friends are here. Franklin, this is unacceptable. Good morning. Good to see you. Good morning. You meant when you moved here. <laughs> Not the first time visiting Metro TV. Right. When Metro TV relocated. <laughs> yes. To... But I've spoken to Metro TV uh, right. Zoom. virtually. Right. But not physically. So right. I'm grateful to be here. But well, you should have been here. I mean, physical, your physical presence is always is always welcome. Well, I'm here today. <laughs> that's what that that's what that matters. Yes. <laughs> okay. Good to see you, frankly. It's been a while. It's been a while, yes. What you, have you been up been... to? Well, I've been uh, I've been up to the same game you uh, you have been up to in the media, right. just trying to do the policy aspect of it, right. policy analysis aspect of it. Right. Um, it's been a bit quieter at some point. Right. But it doesn't mean we are not working. Right. Uh, these days, we do quite a lot of engagement. Okay. Uh, we've been doing a number of policy advocacy within the what I call the private sector space. We've right. been having conversations with uh, G the GIZ, the German Development Organization. Right. We've been having conversations about deepening private sector right. uh, investments and the dialogues, basically, in the okay. country. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see. That's interesting. And But you're, you're going quiet, and I don't know whether it was quite strategic or it was just that you've been, you've been too busy to be engaged in the media. Well, I'm not sure about going quiet. I mean, as an organization, there are other lieutenants who work as well. And right. as I said, we've been doing a number of programming. It's just that some people have not been paying attention. Right. You know, every Saturday I'm on your sister network. Absolutely. Which is uh, CTFM. Besides my colleagues, Bright Simmons, Kofi Bentil, some of our fellows, Godfrey Buckwin, I mean, Pierre Champon. They've been quite vocal and right. they've been working really right. hard. Uh, the likes of uh, Dennis Asari yep. and co have been working really hard. So sometimes it's good to take a back seat as well. Right. If you mean that, if you mean you haven't heard from me directly, mm. uh, maybe you have a point, but it's also part of the strategy, really. An so organization Ima is not built around one person. Absolutely. So Imani's been talking. Not necessarily you, but Imani. Oh, Imani talking. has been speaking, and, yeah. and I've been talking, but I've also yeah. allowed my lieutenant to do that, a lot of the talking. Absolutely, and and it's useful because that that's how an organization grows. Really. Right. You have one of the finest brains. In fact, you 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 assembled some of the finest brains in this country to work with Imani Africa. And I'm wondering, how do you how where do you where and how do you get these guys to work with Imani Africa? Well, I'm grateful to hear that, and I'm sure my colleagues are quite appreciative of that as well. You see, a general a leader is the one who surrounds himself with far smarter people than himself. I mean, that's the way I understand leadership. Right. And so, um, if there's anything to be said about the current leadership of the country, uh, maybe they can take a cue from that as well. Right. Uh, I'm not saying the president is not smart, but I think some of his men obviously are not that smart, really, right. and uh, the reasons for which we are in the mess. See. But... Uh, so that's the philosophy I use, right. and I think uh, the philosophy every high achiever is supposed to be is supposed to uh, live by, really. Right. So that's the way it's supposed to work, really. Right. As a leader, you can't know it all, and even when you know it all, uh, you need to also listen. That's interesting. As I've been you, waiting to hear the president do a reshuffle. Yeah, we'll get there. I mean, one of the reasons why you've joined us is because you have some very very interesting views you want to share about governance in general, um, economy. Um, etc. Now, you you talked about policy advocacy. It was something which you've been busy undertaking. Now, just yesterday, or two, a few days ago, you sent me an invitation. Unfortunately, I couldn't um, I couldn't join you because I was very busy with other things. But there's some U.S. Embassy man invitation um, where you're saying that the U.S. government representative to the U.N. is going to be speaking on the U.S. foreign policy on food security initiatives across Africa. The U.S. Embassy in Ghana, in collaboration with Iman, will be hosting a cabinet-level U.S. government representative, Ambassador Linda um, Thomas, Thomas Greenfield. Greenfield. I was a representative of the United States of America to the United Nations as a guest speaker on food security. And, you know, you actually invited me. Unfortunately, I want to be apologizing for that because I couldn't attend. But before we even get into this, I think that we would, um, you and I have a common friend. I'm a Bernard Avle. Oh. Um, a very good friend of mine. I mean, he's a media colleague. We started CTFM together. He lost his wife um, a few days ago. It's been a very sad um, right. event indeed. And um, you and I have been on the phone already. We've been talking about this issue. Um, 
what would, would you have to say about this unfortunate incident before we move on um, to talk about um, the main, the VEX issues for the day? Well, you know, um, death is not something that we wish for anyone leaving, right. even though it's a certainty. Um, to our brother, uh, I can only say commiserations. Uh, I knew Justine quite well as well. Right. Uh, but many people did not know that Justine, when Bernard was, uh, uh, well, as, uh, for lack of a better term, going after her. Well, was chasing her. Chasing her. Right. Uh, I knew her. And I remember Bernard was leaving for his postgraduate studies and had to uh, jokingly tell me that make sure you take care of her for us. Oh, wow. You know, so uh, at the time we had, we had hosted a program at uh, Asashi University. Right. And Justine was part of it as well. Right. So uh, it's been a very long-term sort of friendship. And I'm truly, truly sad. Um, my sympathies to Bernard and Justine's family um, and to the network that he works at CTFM and to all his friends, really. Um, our hearts are, and our sympathies are with him at this right. moment. And may her soul rest in peace. And right. Bernard, um, take heart. Um, you know, I'm not sure you'll be able to monitor any media house at my media station at the moment, but I'm sure somebody who's watching may be able to pass on this information. I've been trying to reach him, but it's quite understandable. Well, it's difficult. It's phone, really difficult, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a, that's a, very, that's a tough one. Yeah. So let's come back to the main issue for the day. And uh, somebody just sent me a message that he, he said you're not very you know, audible enough. So we should please ask you to... Well, I, you know, I, I, these days I've been, I've been quite uh, inaudible. Right. Right. So I'll probably raise my voice. A, a little bit. Just right. a little bit. Right. But what is, this, what is this Imani U.S. Embassy program about? I mean, it's about food security. It's a very important, um, it's a very important subject, though. I mean, food security. But what is it about? Well, we were quite grateful to the U.S. Embassy to, uh, reaching out to us to collaborate on this very important program. Okay. This, uh, it was an auspicious day, by the way. Right. And the whole idea was As you was can see that, on the screen, Sam, um, these are shots from yesterday's These are shots uh, from yesterday's yeah. event. That's Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield right. speaking. Um, the whole idea essentially was to uh, have a platform for the ambassador to speak to us about U.S.'s interventions or contributions to... Uh, food security across okay. the world, and spe particularly in Africa. Um, and she lived, she lived up to the billing, really, uh, even though, of course, she also made time to speak about the Russian-Ukraine war as having impacted greatly on the current food insecurity issues. As you can understand, within the world of diplomacy, she definitely needed to speak about that, irrespective of what we thought. She yeah. gave the fact. Right. She gave the fact from her standpoint that indeed uh, Russia had become a pariah and in contributing to food insecurity on the, on the continent. In mm -hmm. fact, there was a statistic she, men she, she mentioned, which was that the Russian-Ukraine conflict alone had uh, roped in close to 40, 40 to 45 million people uh, into uh, 40, 40 million more people have become hungrier. I see. You know, um, that's a huge number. That's a huge number, more wow. than the population of Ghana, really. Yeah. And so, 40 um, yeah. Wow. But you see, um, but before all of this, by the way, I mean, when I had my turn to speak, one of the things I highlighted was the fact that um, long before the Russian Ukrainian conflict, uh, there were close to about 282 million people on the continent who were hungry. Okay. You know, so the conflict and the COVID had roped in about 100 million more people right. uh, into the hunger, hunger industry, for, for lack of a better term. Right. So it's, 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 it's a mixed bag, really. While we blame Russia, Ukraine, which is more like the recent or the immediate cause, mm -hmm. uh, the more remote causes actually largely uh, the doings of our own government. I see. You know, um, in 2003, African governments pledged to contribute 10% of annual, total annual expenditures right. on uh, agriculture. But since then, they've done barely 4%. For some countries, have done 2%. Right. Ghana, between 2015 and 2020, did 2%. You know, so... We are also not living up to the billion, really. And so while we are grateful to the likes of America uh, giving its uh, benevolence in terms of helping uh, to alleviate food insecurity, um, there's a point she made also which meant that Africa could feed itself, which is true, uh, which was the point I also highlighted that if we invested in our own system, if we just allocated the sums we say would allocate to agriculture, 
would have been less impacted by the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, really. So a lot of charity begins at home, at home on right. this particular issue. Mm -hmm. We were very happy to collaborate with the U.S. Embassy and the University of Ghana. It was a well-attended program. Imani's guests were there, as well as the students uh, from the faculties of agriculture were there in their numbers. And uh, it was a well-attended program. It mm. was a good program, really. And right. we're grateful for the partnership. I see. Was there somebody from the government side? Um, was there a government You rep? mean as they, in, in attending the program? Attending the program, yes. Well, people were invited. A lot of people were invited. I think the, former, the current Deputy Minister of Finance had promised to come. Okay. But I'm sure she was uh, busy somewhere. Right. Uh, but the import, again, was that she was speaking to Africa and the world. Don't forget, when a high-level ambassador of that nature speaks, and that's a very powerful position, by right. the way. Right. Uh, if you know her, she's been more like the uh, chief of staff for... Um, should I say, it's all civil servants at the UN from the United States. Right. That's a very powerful position. Right. When she speaks, wherever she speaks around the world, it's listened to around the world. Right. So uh, irrespective of whether your leaders were there or not, the message was sent to Africa. And indeed, she made a point about gifting Africa some money, about 150 million US dollars, uh, to help alleviate the food insecurity issues. Okay. Well, it may sound like a drop in the ocean, but if you added that to all the monies that they've given Africa this year, it's about $6.6 billion. Then again, like a drop in the ocean, if we compare it to the grand corruption that takes place on the continent, right? right. We say that the child dies every second of poverty, hunger, and uh, more nutrition. Right. But uh, as you know, $4,500 gets stolen on the continent every three seconds. That's every second, rather. That's interesting. Yeah. Very so we are we are we are we are grateful for the magnanimity of the U.S. government, but they give Uganda about twenty million dollars in order to fix some of its issues okay. in agriculture. Ghana was given two point five million dollars uh, to fix certain interventions within okay. uh, as they relate to fertilizer. Right. Yeah. Now it's interesting. You you know this Ukraine China oh, sorry this Ukraine Russia war thing and. And the role it has played, because food, food is part, it's, it's an important component of the economy. Mm. Now, it's interesting you raised this uh, matter about, and in fact, it came up in the conversation there, which has to do with whether or not the extent to which the Ukraine Russia war has contributed to the economic, you can call it, challenges that we have or the economic mess that we find ourselves in. As you do know, in the last, in the last few months, it's mm. become a very, very topical issue, which the government is being told by the minority, for instance, and some critics, and including Imani, that, look, the, the challenges that we have at the moment is not blamable squarely on these external factors. So the government mentions COVID and mentions Russia, Ukraine war. And you say, no, and when I say you, not asking you, because I haven't heard your personal opinion on that matter, but I've heard some well, you've heard Imani's position on this. Right, right Imani's yeah. position, which is to say that we, it's largely due to some um, internal decisions or policy decisions that we've taken, which has brought us to. Can you help us appreciate a bit more when you say that, yes, Ukraine-Russia war has created some problems, but then our problems are more self-inflicting? Well, I mean, the general narrative, and, and it's not just Ghana, uh, the narrative in Ghana, but those who watch Ghana have long held the view that we're, we come in a basket case right. way before the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. Right. Basket case because our debts were rising. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that um, the IMF had actually warned in 2017 that we were, we were a candidate for debt overhang, basically. Sure. So I call it a debt iceberg. And if the IMF says that your debt is at 84% of GDP, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's, that's not something you can blame solely on the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. Because mm -hmm. before that conflict, in 2019, we were already sleeping. Right. You know? And so, um, and again, the reasons are not far-fetched, really. Uh, they, they are very close, close at home. Uh, we splurge a lot. Um, we we spent too much money. In the run-up to the elections. We've not been fiscally prudent. Well, we've not been fiscally prudent. We borrowed too much. And I don't think the, the investments we've made uh, with the borrowings have become have actually returned the value that we wanted. Okay. A lot of it have been largely consumption-driven. 
you know, when people talk about free SHS, a free SHS is probably like a drop in the ocean mm. when it looks at the amount of money we, we are spent on it. But the amount of money we spent on nebulous projects, one village, one dam, all those monies that were sanctioned at the presidency for the various projects under the Ministry of Special Development Initiatives, returning zero value and underlying zero value because I've not seen a single document, mm. any analysis done, not even by the former Ministry of uh, Monetary and Evaluation, not even by the current economy management team, right. to do an evaluation of these projects that these million dollars per constituency went into. And we've not seen any valuation done on any of those projects. should tell you something, that these projects were sloganeered at the elections, and so they remain on basically not going to return any value. Invaluable, uh, I'm using invaluable here advisedly, because the values in return could not match the investments we made. And okay. we keep on doing that, mm. right? I mean, we spend too much in, with uh, planting for food and jobs, but the value, the, the contribution of agriculture to the GDP has been dwindling, right? As we speak, it dwindled from about 29% in the mid 2015. Uh, by 2015, it had dwindled up to 20, about 20, 20%. Right. No, by 2020, right? right? As I speak, it's going to grow by only 21% between now and 2025. Mm -hmm. So that's the way we should be measuring some of these impacts of the investments we make in those sectors. We are not saying nothing at all was achieved, but if you gave me that money, I probably would have returned much more value than give, being given to a government entity for which there has not been any real value in addition. So our problems that's were... on the expenditure side. Yeah, on the expenditure side, really. Right. But of course, I mean, if you borrowed money mm -hmm. and you, you spent quite a lot also servicing the debt, don't forget we spent almost, by that, this year, for instance, um, by the first quarter of this year, the government has spent almost 44% of its earnings on servicing debt. Right. Well, on the other side, if you flip the coin, it's actually short up really, to 50, about 57% or so now, currently as we speak. Um, well, that's pretty high. I mean, if you added that to the fact that government spends a lot on wages and salaries, right. that gives you almost 80% of the money Ghana right. receives. And then your statutory payments, for instance. And, and, and spending on both servicing debt and paying wages. Right. Um, so, clearly, our, that department, fiscal responsibility in that, depart that department had suffered greatly. And I think we all know the issues, really. So, we cannot necessarily blame the Russian-Ukrainian war. What the Russian-Ukrainian war did to us was to expose the vacuousness of the argument that we were solid. We built a solid economy. Because even though we were growing at 7%, this growth was largely on paper. I mean, if the growth had been really real, we shouldn't be suffering the effects we suffered or we kept suffering, we kept having right now. So you're suggesting that the fundamentals were weak? Yeah, I mean, fundamentals yes, have been quite weak. I mean, the structural nature of our economy has been known to be quite weak anyway. Right, anyway so it's yeah. not, this is not new. Mm. The point I'm making is that when we had the opportunity to build on what John Mahama did, and don't forget, I mean, there's often less emphasis placed on John Mahama's contribution uh, to this, the economy growing in 2017 and 2018, and to the largest time in 2019. What role did John Mahama play? Well, the investments he made in the energy, even though we chided him, Investments he made in the energy specifically, all these uh, investments with the ENI and all of that, uh, stabilizing the power supply before the current government took over, were significant enough. Because if you think that energy is one of the root causes of the current global challenges, we already were saved electricity-wise by the investment John did. So my point I'm making is that um, a lot of the growth we had in 2017, 2018, to last time 2018, were due to John Mahama's investments. That's interesting. What we didn't do was to protect those investments with sensible policies and sensible projects. We splashed a lot in 2020, in the elections, we spent so much. But even before 2020 election, we had wasted a lot of money on nebulous projects supervised by the Minister of Special Development Initiatives. I'm sure you've had colleagues of mine, my cousins, Imani's cousins, yep. the other civil society actors, do evaluations of some of these projects. And the verdict had been damning that a lot of the investment did not return any value, right? I've decided to take free SHS out of it because, as I say, 
even though we spend close to five to, to point five to six billion cities on free SHS, it pulls in, in, into insignificance if you compare it to the amount of money we spent on procurement leading projects supervised by the Minister of Special Development Initiatives. Okay. Right at the heart of the presidency. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, we knew the, the, the medicine for our, 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 our ailments. We we're not ready to, to take the bitter pill. And unfortunately, we'll now be scapegoating the IMF for coming in, or for us going to the IMF. Okay. Because you will now be saying that, well, Russia and Ukraine, and now IMF is the reason why we are where we are. But the story is that, look, the investments the previous administration made should have been protected properly. Mm. And even though we're growing at 7.5%, 7, 7 I'm not saying the current government did not contribute anything to rates, but I'm saying that those investments were propelled by the investments that were made. Because take it, I mean, 2017, if you grew close to 7%, what investments have you made? What decisions economically have you made, really, to grow at that, at that rate? And 2018 as well. It's interesting, you, it's interesting you're making this point, because we've, we've heard government communicators say time and again, in fact, when you criticize them for, I mean, when you criticize the government for the way they've handled the economy, they'll tell you that in 2017, 2018, the economy was growing, was on an upward trajectory, yeah, we 7%. Know, we knew now, that. you are telling us that governments must stop saying this because they cannot, by the stretch of any imagination, take credit for the growth, the growth of that economy, because... These were investments that were made by the former president, John Mahama, which, well, which they are, have actually inherited. Yeah. So really, you want, so you, want, you want to be convinced about which, what policy measures were, to, were put in place to grow the economy by that 7% for a government that had just come into power. That, that's the question well, you're asking. Well, I mean, that's the point. Every, every serious, um, intelligent observer yeah. would attribute this growth in 2017, 2018, to a large extent, to a lot of John Mama's investment. Okay. Uh, all I'm saying is that, not that this government did not do anything at all, and that at the very least, they were policing those investments that were to come on stream anyway. What they didn't do was that their own investments which should have propelled the economy to grow at almost 10%, their own manifesto promise, did not materialize because they started splurging, right? I mean, it's only someone who wants to bury his head in the sand who would say that what I'm saying is not true. But there's someone else in the current government who used to be the chairman of the finance committee of the party who had said the same thing. That the, I'm just forgetting his name, uh, the former chairman of the finance committee in parliament. Oh, that's uh, Dr. Uh, Osibe. Uh, uh, Osibe, Osibe yes, he said something Osibe, similar. Sorry. Right. Yeah. I mean, you can Google him and find out. Right. Where before he said that, we, were, we, were, we at the money have been saying that as well. You know, so um, again, it's not necessarily to say that this government did not contribute anything to the economy. All we are saying is that a chunk of that investment, that growth we saw in 2017 and 2018 was due to the investment that were made, some of the policies that were made by the previous administration. Um, and, and I'm saying that we could, have got, we could have, at the very least, we could have, been, um, we could have built bulwarks against these shocks that were experienced externally to a larger degree, about 70% uh, degree, had we protected those investments and have we made wiser investments by the current administration? Now, but how about the... But sorry, we're, we're, we're sort of narrowing this conversation to what GM did or did not do, because that's not why you're here. But we also had the same government communicators actually blame the former president for taking certain decisions that, you know, sort of put this country in a situation where it had to pay huge debts. And they talk about excess power which was procured by the by the by the by the GM administration which this government said it is paying and that's why in fact mid-year budget review it came up but the, the finance minister said one of the reasons why we have ballooning debt is because we're paying for excess capacity I've heard John Jinapo ask that the government should give us specific you know power companies that are being paid for these excess capacity charges yeah. And that in itself has been shrouded so in all kinds a, of... So, so, so I'm just saying that, I don't know whether you have a take on that as well. Well, there's a challenge with some of the accountability when it comes to the figures. Okay. Um, this whole issue about debt restructuring within the power space, uh, we haven't heard creditably on that by, from, the, from this administration. Okay. I mean, to continuously blame the former administration for the, some of the debts within the sector is, is a bit unfair. 
because you had promised to restructure this debt. And all we've had is that we've not had any certainty of the figures, you know, so it's very difficult to actually believe. I mean, we were part of, part of the conversation uh, when this whole this restructuring debt within the energy sector started. But along the way, we didn't hear anything again. All we heard was that, well, there are still debts, lingering debts, and we don't, have, we don't know the true fidelity. Uh, we don't know the true picture of this current debt. So John Ginapo is right to ask those questions. You know, when I say that the previous administration's interventions also helped the current growth, it's, it's not a fluke. Right. I mean, they're going to the IMF in itself was good to put this gun up on the path of some sort of certainty, right, right in 2015. Right. That was what gave this administration the opportunity to borrow from the international markets mm -hmm. as if there was no tomorrow. Don't forget that once you were a darling of the West in terms of democracy, peace, and stability, you are already a darling to the market. Mm. What this administration did was that, again, because John went to the IMF in 2015, that giving us the credibility and the hope that the country would pay its debt anyway. I'm saying that my friends in government today took this opportunity to dizzy in heights and started borrowing as if there's no tomorrow. But the borrowing is not probably the issue. What does borrowing was actually used for? What the debt was used for? Even though a significant amount of those debt could be used in retiring old debts, if you are now borrowing at almost 20 something percent and you are clapping for yourself because you thought your debts, were, your loans were your bonds were subscribed, you're actually stringing a rope around our necks. All that wouldn't have mattered if the debts were actually qualitatively applied. Mm. And I'm just saying to you that most of the projects this administration superintended, and I'm taking free SHS out of it once again were quite unfortunately not driven by value for money considerations. Look, take for instance, wow. look at the fiscal, uh, fiscal hold that we created for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Between 2010 and 2014, the fiscal irregularities, the financial fiscal irregularities within the ministries, departments, and agencies uh, amounted to about 1.3 billion U.S. Ghanaian cities, right? Yeah. From 2015 to 2020, that has grown by 13 times. To almost 13 billion Ghana cities. Mm. These are this is data from the Auditor General's report. Right. Even if you don't take all I've said about splurge and wastefulness uh, to heart, check the content. Check of the, the content of the Auditor report. General's report, and that's just MDAs. If you added all the other statutory bodies, you are looking at almost 45 billion Ghana cities. How much are we likely to get from the IMF? Probably a billion and a half. Right. If we strike hard, if we strive hard, we might probably get two billion. Mm. So the point I'm making is that our problems are largely domestic, they are known, and they are mostly fiscal recklessness. That's interesting. In case just joined us, I'm having a conversation with the president and founder of Imani Africa. Uh, that's Mr. Franklin Kujo, who has made a quick um, visit to Metro TV. We invited him, and he's he actually accepted our invitation to be here and is having a conversation with us about his, his opinion or his thoughts about the economy and what has brought us to where we are. And he has said some really, really fascinating and interesting stuff about, you know, the where we started from 2017 and where we are at the moment. And some of the, for him, the reasons why we are where we are. He does not agree with the narrative or the argument that we are in this economic crisis because of the Ukraine, um, Russia war, and COVID. He says, yes, it play, played a role, but it came at a time when the economy itself was on a downward spiral. And it's just the, these two, you can call it exogenous factors, only came to expose the fact that the economy was already in a terrible shape. Um, and that's, that's, that's his verdict as far as the economy is concerned. But, but then he mentioned something about, you know, he, he, he's talked largely about ex, the expenditure side of things, um, which has to do with, he says, government has spent on nebulous, nebulous projects, which has not brought value for the huge amounts of money that we've spent on these projects. I'm not going to pick his mind on the revenue side, because the economy is essential about, about revenue and expenditure. That's what we call the fiscals. Okay, and how we serve is the debts that we borrow, uh, that's the, 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 the monies that we borrow, and, and that's what the fiscal regime is all about. So let's not tap his mind about the, the revenues that we, or the revenue measures that we have put in place. And 
Talk about which e-levy has been one of the most topical issues that um, have come up lately. I mean, Imani Africa have, as a matter of principle, were against the way the policy was going to be rolled out. Whether the policy itself were against it. Maybe I'll not find out from Franklin Kujo. So, Franklin Kujo, you... I would have to come back to free SHS uh, because there's well, some issues about free SHS. But I want us to I want to pick, pick, pick your mind briefly about e levy. There was know, something that you wrote on your on your Facebook handle, and you were talking about. You said just so we're clear, the fact that eighty percent of people respond in a survey that they will use Momo less, or that they will reduce their mobile transaction, does not mean that Momo volumes or value will drop by eighty percent. If the survey respondents each reduce their use of Momo by just 1%, then total value of volume, depending on what you're measuring, would drop by just 0.8% and not 80%. Why did you find it necessary to put this out? What was the context? Oh, there, there was, I don't know whether it was out of mischief or probably misunderstanding. Right. When we did a survey on the e-levy, um, we said that the transactions, Momo user transactions would have dropped by 80%. Right. Uh, what it meant was that the percentage of uh, we didn't mean that the total value of Momo contributions dropped by 80%. That's right. not what we meant. Mm. That what it essentially meant was that if I were doing uh, 100 cities every month, prior to the every day prior yes. to the passage of the e levy, mm -hmm. and I'm not doing 80 cities, yes, that's obviously a drop, yes. right? So uh, we meant individual. Uh, persons, uh, what they call uh, subscri subscription to the e levy, right. but not the value per se. Mm. But again, if you are even looking at the total value inhalation within the space, mm -hmm. we are just saying that uh, it has wiped off a significant, uh, significant amount of the value of the economy. Right. But not in terms of the value, I mean, the total value of Momo transactions. Right. Even though it would drop, we are not saying it would have dropped by 80%. That right. would have been fanciful and far-fetched to make anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so that was on the e levy. But just, just, just to be clear, you know, you made a point about the, um, what was it again, that the Ghana's uh, revenues... Yes, not, talking about, not, we've talked about... Oh, that's true. We are, doing 12, kind of revenue. we are doing 12% uh, in, an, in, a, in an economy, in a, on a so continent tax where... To tax to GDP. On a, on a continent where everybody else is doing probably about 15%. And, uh, you know, but I have a little construct to this particular narrative. This whole idea that Ghanaians do not pay tax, or probably tax thieves, quite really infuriates me. Really? Because unless, of course, you are talking about direct taxes... A lot of us, we pay a lot of taxes, mm. really. Almost every Ghanaian pays a tax. Right. We are dealing with indirect tax. Right. If you want to optimally revise the taxation regime, maybe if you want to apply a flat tax so that everybody can pay, mm. or probably um, decide that you want to do VAT mm -hmm. for everybody, mm -hmm. maybe let's, let's, let's have a conversation. Right. But let's also have another conversation. What is the optimal tax we should be paying? What I mean is, what is the amount of money we should be giving to our governments to apply to projects? They shouldn't come up and do have a huge wish list, which will contain a lot of non-essentials. That's a, that side of conversation we are not having as well. So while we say that, oh, we are not paying enough tax, exactly how much do we really need to prosecute the agenda anyway? So if you are borrowing so much as well in order to apply to certain development initiatives, the, the understanding is that those initiatives should return value they must be productive. They must go to the productive elements of our economy, the private sector. If the private sector had had those amounts the government has borrowed, trust me, the value would have been much more than we are seeing with the government. Mm. Because the private sector would have been driven by, well, maybe profit, but also sustainability. Right? And I'm not saying that a country should be run necessarily as a corporate entity. But in the 21st century, that's exactly the mindset you need. Right. First of all, it's not your money. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you're running a company and you are borrowing that much, we should see returns. Right. So I'm saying two things. One, we are saying we don't pay enough tax. But do we have an optimal tax regime in this country? Mm -hmm. How much do we really vet the project the government wants to supervise? Right. You can't just say because you've been voted for, you can decide to build a cathedral. You understand? So what's the problem you have with this cathedral? No, because I'm just I saying mean, that, it's... listen, you can't say... Yes, you are given a mandate under an election. 
All I'm saying is that we should probably vet a lot of these promises a lot more. But don't forget that Cathedral was not even part of the wish list. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. But yeah. we splashed close to 300, 400 million Ghana right, cities on, on it. it. That's significant money. So if these monies, so far. if these monies that were borrowed were applied this way, and they, they keep being applied this way, do you think there will be real value in return? Absolutely not. It will eat away the productive elements of the economy. Mm. And those productive elements of the economy, who otherwise would have needed these injections of funds to grow their individual economies uh, so that they can pay the tax that you want, will never happen. Right. Because you are eating away their own survival through borrowing and not spending wisely. And you jack up the taxes as well, further eating into their little savings and margins they have to borrow. I mean, what was all this point about using a part of the E-Levy to, to create the entrepreneurship? By you government? start. I've the never seen... The tells us that we're moving from NAPCO to Governments, start, governments to have never been recent. effective. Mm. Governments have... In most parts of the world. Tell me, which parts of the world have government been effective at creating entrepreneurship? Unless maybe dictatorial states, of course. I'm not saying China is a mm. dictatorial state, but China is a communist state. Right, communist and it's near states. dictatorship. Maybe they are a bit more intelligent when it comes to creating those stuff. But even in China... There's a the thriving capitalism that is there. The state recognizes the role of the private sector in creating jobs. So they are interested in shoring these numbers up, helping the private sector to create jobs. Right from the onset, when all these youth interventions were created by previous administrations, what didn't we hear? The waste and the splurge. I was a bit mortified when I heard the minister suggest, my good friend, that a part of the E-level will be used in creating entrepreneurship. By who and for who? Look, NAVCO said it was going to graduate about 100,000 people onto the path of entrepreneurship, private entrepreneurship. They've barely scratched almost 100 people. I've not seen, I've not seen any report showing that even 100 people have been put on the path of sustainable entrepreneurship after spending close to 600 million Ghana cities on NAVCO. And if there is, you'd, you'd be more than happy to see it. I'll be more than happy to see it. And now we've transited them to use that. Another splurging entity. All I'm telling you is that F you, see, what's, what's you see, you see, you see the narrative assisting with assisting people with capital for them to start their own. There's business. nothing wrong with assisting people to they'll start taxes, capital. Employ people, but if you look at economy growth, well, but that's the way it is. If that money were given to the private sector, you get value for value in return. You would mm. have numbers, right? You will be told exactly that okay, we started off with this. This is the value in return as in X number of people have been employed. They've added a significant value to the economy. Have you seen a document telling us that NAFCO has added 0.00001% to the that GDP yet. of the country? I haven't seen that yet. That's the way we should measure those impacts. Okay. Not just because we see people going up and down claiming they've been employed. I'm not, and I'm not saying that people should not be supported. But if you're supporting people, you have to decide whether you're doing it socially or commercially as in, as in you're expecting returns. Mm. And we are being told that there's a return. Maybe social return. Mm. Maybe that's what the finance minister talks about, social cohesion. Or social political return. Well, social cohesion, because most of these people would have been wandering around the streets, in the streets anyway, and it would have added to our social pressures. Yeah. But that's not, the, that's not the only way we should be measuring these impacts anyway. Mm. We should measure them because, as I said again, these are monies you take from the taxpayer. And if you are not having an optimal taxation conversation, you cannot, by that stretch, suggest that Ghanaians are not paying the tax. As I said, a lot of us pay indirect taxes. If you are dealing with direct taxes, we'll talk about it. Maybe we should start, we should start looking at the taxation system we have in Ghana. Make it uh, lower and apply it across board. Maybe a flat tax would have helped. Right. Once it's smaller, people are willing to pay. Speaking about taxes and levies, should, should we cancel e-levy? I wouldn't say cancel e levy. E levy ought to be reconfigured. Okay. So the rates must be reduced to 0.5%, for instance, and then come back you with a You think we'll PR. get better value if we reduce it to 0.5%? Um, we'll get a lot more people we'll, opening. I'm sure we'll do that. But unfortunately, because of the publicity they gave it, it's by, by, by going to the, I mean, going the highest percentage, it's very difficult to have people come back to, to, to using e levy the way they've, used, they, they've decided to use e levy But it's always a VKF, really. It will go down and come up. And government should take advantage of the fact that it's going up, as in it's 
patronage will only go up if the if the, if the rate is revised. It's lower. Yes. That's interesting. So in principle, you're not against e-levy because you well, believe no, the government is No, we've never really been taxes. against e-levy. Right. In fact, all we were saying was that it was unintelligent mm. to introduce it at the time that it was being introduced. Okay. Because of two things. You are going to have... Uh, defeat the digitalization uh, of the economy, the efforts in that space. And at the same time, given the nature of the economy right now, you didn't want to keep piling taxes on people, really. You understand? So let's let it be known that we are not averse to paying taxes as Ghanaians. All Ghanaians are asking for is what optimal arrangement do you have for us? The things you say you want to do, let's calculate it. Maybe this, let's have a proper conversation about the taxation situation in the country. Let's mm. not parrot one side. Okay. That says only 12%, there's only 12% percent percentage, uh, what's it called, contribution of taxes to the GDP. Question is, how much money does the government raise on the back of those same taxes, which we are now at almost 84% of GDP right. debts? Right. How much of it has been used to grow the economy? What has been the value in return? And I've just submitted to you that if we are doing Ministry for Special Development Initiatives, which are, even though has been collapsed, its ghost still permeates and still is roving around in nebulous projects, there's no way you are going to get value. And it's not politics. You see, it hurts me greatly when people watching this program, some will be saying, oh, there they go again. It's politics. Fucking politics. Just ask yourself, if you, were, if you got all that money, if those monies were given to a corporate entity, what they were capable of doing with that money? What would have been the resource or return value? I'm not saying that corporate entity may not fail. Right. But when they fail, you pay a price. Okay. Right? I'll pick your quick thoughts on two issues before you take leave of us. Ghana card and free SHS. Um, it appears that government is been flip-flopping on whether to, re to review free SHS or not. We've heard the finance minister in parliament who says free SHS will not be touched. And then my very good friend, who's one of the business reporters at Joy, who interviewed the finance minister, says, well, a review is, has always been on the table. And then just yesterday, the, the president, I think is in one of the uh, upper regions, I think upper west or upper east, and in a media interview, the president talks about the fact that as far as he's concerned, nobody is going to touch any of the government's social intervention programs because it lies at the very heart of the development paradigm that this government intends to take us. And it is also very dear. The president said it is very, very dear to him. And he mentions free SHS. He says, nobody's going to touch free, H free SHS. Nothing is going to happen. I don't know what you think it's happening with this free, H free SHS thing. I mean, you, we know what your position has been as far as free SHS is concerned. You would have wished it even start at all in the first place. But let me just do this. Those of you who have um, um, opinions that you intend to express, um, please send us a text or a WhatsApp message to 0249 one five five or six four six zero two four nine one five five six four six. Do you get the impression that government is confused about what to do with free SHS? Well, the latter day issues or things um, has obviously led me to that position that okay. there's a bit of confusion because if you hear government spokespersons speak and high ranking spokespersons. Um, you don't get the certainty that this will be done, even though individually they've expressed their thoughts. I mean, the GES director expressed a thought we all had, but within 24 hours he beat a retreat because he had the finance, sorry, the Minister for Education had not given the blessing for him to say so. Right. Um, look, I'm sure that within the hearts of all these government spokespersons, even including the president, he wished, we all wished there was some little review. Uh, review not necessarily that does not necessarily mean cancellation. Right. And I think that's the whole fear that the political fallout of all these conversations about review would mean that it's been defeated. So it's the politics? I think it's the politics, really. And by the way, we have never been against free SHS. What we were against was the wholesale application of free SHS. Mm. When we had that Banku breakfast, uh, Kinke breakfast in Nanado while it was... Uh, was in opposition yeah. and discussed free SHS. Yeah. Many people do not know that. And we went ahead to do a projection after 2020, after right. that conversation with him, mm. uh, as to what free SHS would look like in 2020. We were of the view that, look, you should just use the means testing approach to determine those who can pay and cannot mm. pay, and use the scholarship secretariat, put it into action so that it will be devoid of all the politicking 
And but then, they've asked this question, frankly, and you've not been able to tell them any answer. They says, but whose child should be left out of free SHS? The rich man pays taxes, the poor man pays taxes. So if the rich man's child is benefiting from the taxes they pay, why do some people have a problem with that? Well, there's a reason why there's something we call progressive taxation. Okay. There's a reason why um, you and I are not on leap. Livelihood empowerment against mm -hmm. poverty. Right. Because even though everybody pays a tax, right. not everybody has been roped on to leap. Right. I mean, the government did not go onto the streets or go into every household and say, I want to rope you into leap by force. Mm -hmm. But we all pay taxes, True. don't we? So there you have your answer. Apostle. There's means testing. Right. There's a reason because there are some people who need it more than others, right? Mm -hmm. So when you do the means testing, you, you find out those people. The other argument I've heard is well, it's very difficult to look for people who are... Because everybody's all of a sudden going to say they need help. They need help. But I'm pretty sure that those who do not need the help are freely willing to contribute to the, to, to the, to the, to the free SHS. Really. So that argument has been dead long ago. I mean, there's you means testing. Moot? I think it's moot, really. I mean, in every progressive society, there are those who are well endowed and those who are less endowed. And so they contribute their quota as, as and when they need to, right? I see. That's what I'm saying. You and I are not on leap. Have right. you asked that reason why? Yeah, because, because we don't need leap. Good. But the government supervises leap using our taxpayer money. Right. So, okay. So you're saying that by that same logic, why isn't government saying that whether you and I like it or not, we should be on leap? Just like it's done with free well, That's the point I'm making. Right. Because some people can pay and some people cannot, cannot pay. pay. Right. Some people can live without leap and some people cannot live without leap. So just the way we've been able to identify those who need to be on the on leap, we yeah. can use the same mechanism it's very easy. to identify those it's who need It's very, very easy to do that. Okay. I guess politicians who say they will never have time to do so and that oh, because lifting. everybody needs to uh, uh, enjoy the, the, the freebies as well. Yes. That's interesting. Now, Ghana card. Do you, have, do you have your Ghana card? I do have a Ghana card. And okay. I think the Ghana card, irrespective of what many people will say about it, um, I think should have, it's, it's, it's a good idea, really. I mean, we've never really been against the Ghana card anyway. Even though some proprietary, proprietary design issues we had at a point, and even the cost involved in getting the card, in making the card, we thought Ghana was on the higher side. Right. But we are not necessarily against everybody getting the Ghana card. What we are against is the, the multiplicity of cards, right? The fact that you have a driver's, driver's license? Exactly. And an NHIS card? The good thing, even though we've all those cards, is that they could have been intelligently synced. Okay. We should not necessarily be having a single card. But that's what I the vice president subscribe. has been saying. He said that's I don't, the whole I idea. don't really subscribe to that, that analogy because I have my passport. I should be able to use my passport to do anything I want yes. in this country. Okay. I shouldn't be prevented from using my iPod to my passport to even vote as long as those identities are synced together okay. synchronized in, in a database right so all these databases being collected probably useful the only database I do not find useful in collecting is the, the mobile which one the, the SIM card registration re-registration re registration, it's a yes. totally needless exercise wasteful and that data they are collecting will come to naught because they are not going to use it to, to do anything really? oh come on a total waste of time. Look, if you had your Ghana card, the moment you use those, you, you sync those numbers in the mobile phone company, remember we're given, a, we're supposed to uh, dial a particular number in order to yes. sync our numbers. Yes, before you go to the, um, the, the telcos for them to do it. You shouldn't go to the telcos again. That should have ended it. Well, there's an application then, that's coming up. There's an application that's coming up. So another, you can do another, another silly application. Wasteful. When is, is he even up already? Well, they were supposed to have come two days ago. I don't even understand. Not, yeah, Why are we collecting all kinds of nebulous pay five CDs. That's for the, for just, just to save you all the inconvenience of going to, say, MTN or Vodafone Look, to do the research. NIA has collected our biometrics, right? Yes. So if you link your, your mobile phone to the NIA card, yes. that's it. If the government wants to find out anything about you... Everything is there. It's there already. What's the point in doing biometrics again at the telcos? That's interesting. You're, not, if you're defeating the whole idea that you have even in, you yourself have decided to invest in. That okay. is to unify and di di what's it called, digitalize and ensure that there's seamless application of all these platforms.
Okay. Why are you collecting multiple biometrics anyway? That's and true. now this registration, self registration, means people will therefore um, collect their own what biometrics. That's interesting. Should the finance minister go? I I think there could have been a shake up at the ministry. The finance minister himself could have just said, "Well, I think uh, I said I won't go to the IMF." But I'm not taking to the IMF. And on that singular reason alone, okay. he should have just decided to part ways with the ministry. I see. Because in other far seeing economies, democracies, that's exactly what happens. Okay. You, you think in the UK, a um, finance minister will say, I won't go to the IMF, I won't go to the IMF, and then eventually makes a major U turn, goes to the IMF, and still be at post. Maybe that's why we should have a prime ministerial system in Ghana. Okay. Franklin, it's always um, a pleasure talking to you. You have other engagements this morning, and so we'll let go of you, and then maybe we would um, have another opportunity to have a more detailed conversation. About it's a pleasure you seeing you. that I've been asking just specific questions because right. um, I know you have to go, and yet I have to take as much as I can from you. No problem. Uh, because you've almost become a repository of knowledge. Uh, people say, man, you talk about this, everything. Why? Why don't you just uh, stick to one particular thing? Economy is economy, but you seem to have an opinion well, on everything. what people don't know is that think tanks around the world, I mean, m most think tanks around the world are not single issue focused think tanks anyway. They are not single focused issues. No, and besides, once you have experts who speak on those subjects, why not? Okay. They should be able to speak anyway. Okay. And then doing policy activism in this country, what do you need? If you have the tools to do value for money analysis, cost benefit analysis, you can virtually analyze every government program, okay. policy, right. or uh, project, really. Because right. what do they do anyway? It's procurement lading. <laughs> All right, frankly, thank you very much. And uh, so you have yourself a good day.